Okay, fantastic. I think we have critical mass, uh, Vino, so I think we can start. What do you think? Yep, we do have enough folks to get started. Okay, fantastic. So uh, thanks everyone. Hi, I'm uh, Ido. I'm uh, with uh, LakeFS. I run customer success and with me is Vino. Hi, Vino. Hi, Hi. I'm the developer advocate of Lake for LakeFS and I've been a ML engineer, data engineer, software engineer, and finally now a developer advocate for LakeFS. And yeah, I'm here to help you today with... But still an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going away anywhere anytime yeah. soon. Yeah. Yeah. So you so you're here to 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 discuss. We're here to discuss today a little bit uh uh how to version our ML training data. And thanks for everybody that uh that jumped on that jumped on. Uh so again, you've been doing this uh for a while, uh Vino, and maybe we'll start by asking why is this so hard? Like what's why is it complicated to complicated to do or needed? to version uh, ML data? Um, okay, like as you can see here, first of all, it is a multi-step process. And then between each of these steps, we have a lot going on. We, and the upstream, we are dependent. As ML engineers, we are dependent on fellow data engineers to build the ETL pipelines, to even deliver the raw data given to us. And then, you know, the data quality and all the other challenges that come with it. But then we take that raw data and curate it, create new features depending on what our ML models and requirements are. And once we have that feature, we also want to version it and keep each of these versioned features for later uses because you know some ML experiments tend to repeat the same features a couple of times here and there. So it's always better to do that. And once you have the feature going on, the next step would be the actual model training, which is the ML step and everything else around it is literally just working with data. And once you have the model train, you also want to store different versions of the model because you never know which model at the end of the day is going to prove to be accurate or the right metric, whatever you're optimizing for. So you have a model registry to store all these models and get back to it at a later point in time. All of this is just for one person that I talked about. And imagine you're a team of ML engineers collaborating and you know, taking up a couple of these steps yourself and from your teammates, and it becomes a whole huge mess to deal with which is why a version control system is absolute necessary to actually run ML experiments. Yeah, it's, there's a lot going on. By the way, we, 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 we're we using this uh, picture. You have here the reference of the original uh, person that, shot, that spun it that we found online. It's just, it's one of those ways that helped understand the complexities of trying to work with this because it's really a different beast, right? When we work with ML because we have the data version but but like you're required to many times to go back and reproduce, unlike uh, code that maybe you'll troubleshoot, but this is kind of a mode of operation. And there's the relationship between the code and the data, like which data was used with which code, which data was producing which data, right? And this uh, from here going on, and it's just, just a lot going on over here. Um, so yeah, thanks, that's super helpful. and. That's where LakeFS comes into play, where we basically say, let's manage data the same way as we manage code with LakeFS that sits on top of the object store and provides Git capabilities, which is what we use for the code, right? Like merge branch revert and through an API on the object store itself. So that can be Google storage, AWS, uh, Azure Blob, Minio, and so on and so forth. And then the ecosystem of tools that we have running in a system can either access the object store the same way that they always have, or can go through LakeFS and get uh, these branching capabilities and so on and so forth. Um, before I go further on, I am wondering with, I have a nice amount of people here. I am wondering how many of the people here already heard of LakeFS, so we'll know how much to, should we go in depth here. So uh, Ankit, if you can help us ask that question, that would be great. Uh, would love to, can we? Yeah. So just let us know if you heard of LakeFS before or not, so we'll know how deep to go into the more of this uh, very high level overview. Thank you. And then uh, with LakeFS, what happens is if before we were accessing a collection in the bucket, we made a really easy integration where you can access a uh, name of a commit or a branch identifier. So 
a branch could be prod, test, dev, Vino test one, Vino experiment two, Vino experiment three, right? All these can be uh, branches uh, and a commit can be uh, data at February 3rd, 25, and then we can have metadata associated with it that was used with this code, that was used with this pipeline and so on and so forth. So, uh, and then the, the, the command line, uh, sorry, and then the, the Git actions can be done through a command line or through an API, like we said before, we're gonna show that here live in a minute and through a web user interface. So basically everything here is being, is, is, uh, is being done through LakeFS. And I see that the vast majority of the people here heard of LakeFS before. So I'm not gonna zoom in on LakeFS, but if anybody has questions, of course you have our details and we're happy to go and please don't hesitate to stop us. And that makes me very happy because if you already heard of LakeFS, we can talk about ways that we can version our data and tag the version data with version of code and explore, go back, get data lineage, reproducibility and all these cool things with LakeFS. And Vino, why don't you walk us through how, mm -hmm. how we're gonna show that today? Yeah, so we have talked enough about the challenges and the complex steps that are involved. Now let's go forward and see how LakeFS can actually help you here, right? So in this demo, we will first start with a Docker container where we will have LakeFS and the other dependencies installed. So the first prerequisite is, of course, you need to have Docker installed on your machine. And then we have like ML reproducibility LakeFS sample notebooks that are in our Git repository, which Ido had shared a link of previously, or we might, you know, we even have the link shared in the webinar chat as well for you to refer to. And once we have that, we will go forward and run the steps in our Jupyter notebook, which is to install all the necessary dependencies for LakeFS and for our you know, ML experiment. And then the actual ML experiment would be the fourth step. And then I'll show you how to use LakeFS to reproduce an iteration of an experiment as well. So enough about the steps, let's get started. Mm -hmm. So here I have my LakeFS samples repo. Okay, so just try and get it away from the screen for us. And let's just, here Lake of a Samples has all the different demo notebooks ready for you to try out different use cases of Lake of us. And today we are focused on ML reproducibility. So I'm just gonna go here and then follow the steps that we have in our readme and that should give us detailed in instructions on what to do. And the first one is, yes, have Docker installed on your machine. And the second, we are going to be using Stanford Docs dataset for the ML experimentation side of things today to just do an image classification model using TensorFlow. And we will be downloading this dataset from Stanford Docs as well. And the first step in getting our infrastructure up and running is we will run an everything bagel Docker that will have LakeFS, Spark, Minio, Jupyter Notebook, and all the other services that we will need to run this. And to do that, I'm going to be starting, let's just say ML webinar demo. And let's just clone these repos. Let's clone the LakeFS repository so we have the everything bagel docker running for us. And it's just taking a few seconds. And once you have that, you can go ahead and run the Docker Compose app, but what I've done is that I already have my Docker running here for me. So as you can see, it is gonna spin up 13 containers with Spark, Minio, Trino, and everything ready for me already. I don't have to spin it up here. And now, once you have that step done, we will just have to go to the different ports to see if our services are running fine. And Let's go to the 8,000 port to see LakeFS running. And for me, it logged me in, but then you can also go to our Docker Compose YAML file to access the secret and the access keys for LakeFS. And similarly, on 9001, we have MinIO running. Go to the Docker Compose and you can get the username, username and the password as well. I'm going to 901. I have the MinIO buckets. 
And if I go to the buckets, I can see four different buckets up there. And I had already downloaded images ready for this demo. It's going to take a few minutes otherwise. And you, for you, though, you can go download the images and annotations, which are about almost 700 MB. And then you could just upload it to your bucket in your MinIO UI. And once you have the MinIO also ready, let's go to the Jupyter Notebook at you know, 8888. Again, the password and the login credentials are in the Docker Compose YAML file. Okay. So this is so pretty cool. This is, uh, this is just like a fest so far, right? This is just uh, setting up everything that we need with like a fest. And of course, if in, in, if in my own environment, if I have Jupyter or whatever it is that I use and MinIO or whatever that, that I use, then I can spin up like a fest, the open source solution also in a, in a click and just use my environment. But this is kind of contained. And then if anybody wants to try this out, it's pretty cool that in a single command, we got everything up and running. Yeah, that's true. And also, like it, to start with any project, it's the config and the setup steps that take most amount of time. And all of this is just contained in one, one single command, literally, and we have a Docker ready for you to do everything. And so once we have the Jupyter Notebooks as well, we can go ahead and clone our LakeFS samples kit, which would you know copy the ML experiment demo and the utils files for us which I will do it in. Reproducibility. And once you clone the lake of samples, you will get all these files. And what you would have to do is to just upload the ML experiment demo notebook and the utils notebook to our Jupyter workspace, which I already have it ready handy for us to you know, do the demo. And once we have all of this set up, it's literally just open the demo notebook and follow along the steps. So let's do that as well. So we have like a face, we have a notebook with ML, we have a data set and annotation that we uploaded to MinIO. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting with the, with the steps, right? Exactly. Just making sure I follow. I'm a slow student. <laughs> of course. So the first step is to just, you know, install all the dependencies. And as Ido already mentioned before, you can use LakeFS or you can access LakeFS in different ways, either the UI or the Lake CTL, you know, command line utility or different API clients. And here I'm gonna be using Python LakeFS client. So let us go ahead and install that. And I'm using Boto3 to read and write from my MinIO bucket, which works you know, with the S3-like API. And we're gonna use OpenCV because we are gonna use the OpenCV and TensorFlow for the ML experimentation image classification model. And this is just to import the utilities from the other notebook that we have going. So the dependencies are done. Now let's go ahead with the, all the imports and to configure Boto3, LakeFS, and Spark clients. And the access key and this, the uh, access key and the secret key IDs are found in our Docker Compose YAML, which I have copied it from there. And once we configure all of the you know Spark S3 clients, let us go ahead with the actual ML experimentation demo steps, right? The first is let's go, go ahead and look at the data set, the training data set in our MinIO console. And I have the Stanford docs data and our data set has images and a couple of you know cute doc pictures, if I may. And then it also has annotations, which are just the labels for those you know, doc images that we already have. So since we have the bucket ready, let us now, the next step is to create a new MinIO bucket for the LakeFS repository. So what we're doing here is this bucket, stand for docs data, is gonna have all the training data. And when we are using LakeFS to version this data, we will not be copying this data around. What we would instead do is, as you can see here, I'm gonna go ahead and create ML experiment LakeFS 
repo bucket. So we're going to create a new bucket just for the lake FS repository. And this is just going to have no objects for now. And once we use this bucket later, so what we did is we have a MinIO bucket where the images are there. And we have another MinIO bucket for the lake FS repository. And now we will go ahead and create the lake FS repository. And I'm going to start with a blank repo. Let's just call it ML experiment demo. And the storage namespace is I'm going to use the MinIO bucket that we just created and the default as the main branch and create a repository. And currently, it has no objects. But if you go to MinIO, you should be able to see just a dummy file because Lakef has created a dummy file to see if it has access to the underlying bucket and so on. And cool. Now we had the training data in a different bucket. Now let's see how we can import that into our LakeFS repository. When we try to import it, now we want to actually use the S3 bucket or Minayo bucket that has the training data, which is not this one, but it is the Stanford dogs data, right? This one has the actual training data. So let's go ahead and use this import the data from there and let's put that under the raw prefix imported dogs data from s3 so this was fast uh, i i assume that we didn't actually copy the files when we did this exactly so we had like a few thousand images and then it it, it happened in like less than a millisecond because the lake fs was only creating pointers to the underlying objects and not actually copying all the images into another bucket again. And awesome. you can, Thank you. As you can see, it has just the LakeFS metadata pointers and then the actual dummy file. No image files are present in our you know, S3 repository. Cool. So we have everything ready. Now let's move forward with the experimentation side of things. I have a couple of you know, experiment configs here. First, let's update our LakeFS repository name, which is ML experiment demo. And I have the inches branch, which is main imported, which is where our input images will be now because we imported them. And as you can see, it has both the annotations and images as well. So we're going to use that you know, main imported branch as the ingest branch or where our data is like incoming. And the experiment one and two, as the name says, are going to be two different branches. We, we will create to run two different experiments. And these are a couple of you know, just the variables with different paths to store our process data, configs, artifacts, metrics, and so on. And here I have a bunch of file utils just to read the images from S3, you know, write them back read the model files, write the model files, read the metrics, and so on. It's just a bunch of utility functions. And for the experimentation, the ML experiment really starts here. And for, for my experiment one, I'm going to be using this set of parameters, like a bunch of you know, parts and the hyperparameters that are to be tuned for my specific experiment. And for this one, I'm just experimenting with only three categories and with 100 images each, just for the purpose of this demo, and different values for you know, all the hyperparameters for the ML experimentation. And once you have that... And of course, you no longer access MinIO directly, but everything that you're doing is through repositories and branches uh, going forward. Yeah, truly. Like, as you can see, the images and like all the input data is coming through the specific branch and not directly on the Minio bucket. And so let's go to LakeFS UI and quickly have a look at what it looks like, right? So it, we had the ML experiment demo and it has two branches. Main has literally nothing, but then main imported has the data that we had. Now let's go ahead and create experiment one branch from this main imported branch. And we will see how that looks. A new list branch, only two branches, and we just created a new branch called the MedExperiment1. And you can go see that here. As you see, the ML experiment one and main imported have the same commit 
hashes, meaning they're pointing to the same pointers underneath that are connected to the objects. So when you created the experiment one branch, again, no objects were being copied, only the pointers were being referenced. A few milliseconds, even if it has like a few petabytes of data in main imported, it's gonna still take the few milliseconds because it's only copying the pointers. So we have the branch ready. So let's go ahead and run the experiment. The first step is we have these parameters for this experiment. Let's go and dump that in that branch. So we know at a later point in time, what parameters gave us these models. And once we have that, let's go ahead and load the training data using these parameters. And as you can see, we have our training data, which are in different you know, kinds of cute dogs, of course. And let us go ahead and train the model. And I'm running ML pipeline to train the model and it is going through a sequence of steps. Before that, I'll show you what the ML experiment, the ML pipeline actually contains. So in the ML utilities file that we downloaded, so this is the ML pipeline where it has multiple steps like pre-process the data, split the data into training and test sets, and then train the model and in the end evaluate the model for different metrics and here i'm only concerned about the law the training loss and the accuracy and then in the end it just returns the model and the metrics back to me so this is the ml pipeline that is being run here and you can see you know it is being pre-processed splitting the train and test this is the actual model that we built with several layers and dense layers and so on and then we have our model accuracy is 0.75 because we used only 300 images and number of epochs were very less just for the purpose of this demo. And so we have the model, we have the metrics, the training is done. Now let's go ahead and save it in our LakeFS repo. Currently, if I go to experiment one, I saw a raw file, yes. And then we pushed our config.json as well. Now let's go ahead and save our models and the metrics also. When we save the metrics. As you so can. you're saving the metrics on, on the same bucket through LakeFS? Yeah, I'm I'm saving the metrics under the same LakeFS repository under experiment one branch. And so you get the full context. Yeah, so we have in that branch, we have all context of the configs, the model, the metrics, the configs that generated the model, all of them together, easy for referencing later on. Right, and so we have saved our metrics. Let's go ahead and check it there. Okay, so we do have our metrics, which are being written successfully. Now let's go ahead and write our, oh, okay. So here is how it looks. And we want to commit this as well. So let me go ahead and show you how it looks currently. All of these are under uncommitted changes because we only kept pushing the data, we've not committed it. And in the commits, we only created the repo and just imported the training data. So let's go ahead and commit these. And you can even see in each of these files what were the number of files that got changed in the uncommitted changes. It's just easy for you to refer to it. Look at the you know summary of changes that went in. Let's go and commit this. And as you can see here, commit has a metadata option in the sense you can add any metadata that you want to each of your commits. And here I've chosen to commit all my experimentation hyperparameters and parameters. So at a later point in time, when I refer to this, I know this commit I have used, you know, optimizer as Adam and the train, the train test split ratio as 0.2 and so on. And even in your case, you can even have the trainer, like the user who trained this model also as one of those parameters and whatnot. And so we have committed this. We can go ahead and check that as well. If we check and committed changes, there are nothing because we've committed them. And you can see the commit metadata here and what are the files that went into the specific commit. Awesome, we have all good to go. And let us go ahead and save our model file as well. So when we save the model, as you see, the Keras model getting serialized to go and upload on LakeFS. Again, you can see it here in the uncommitted changes. 
in the experiment one. Okay, there's this. I think you just okay. committed yeah. them, right? Yeah. So there is this artifacts which got pushed and in right. the end changes we have artifacts as well. So let's go ahead and commit this too. Again, in the commit, you know, metadata, I'm going to use the metaparams where I'm just dumping a bunch of my parameter dictionary into it. Okay, so this is how it looks. We have, you know, dumped everything here. Commit is successful. Let's go ahead and check again. In the commit, saved model artifacts as well. Same metadata, you can see the changes in this commit and so on. One interesting thing is, so if, if we go, if we want to go back and see, this is a model file, but who created this model file? Which training data led to this model file? Let's just keep going up our commit history and see what it looks like, right? So if you go to this parent, you see before this was the saving model metrics and the changes. And now you can trace back from your model to your raw data that led to the model, the training data that gave to the ML model that was trained later. So this way you can access the, you can always access this commit history also from the API as well. And it makes it easy to keep a lineage of all the changes that went into your data and the ML pipeline as well. This is great. Which version of, of, of Lake Fest are you running right now in your environment? Um, okay, so I have- 88. That's great. So every so everything that we see here is available at, at 88. And, and that's pretty cool because I because even if I am I limited in the number of commits that I can do across time, like if I want to commit the raw data as it goes in and the ETLs, is that possible? Yeah, you can do like there are no limits on the number of commits you can do at all. For example, here, if it's suppose we have the raw data here and you decided I'm going to try three different methods of normalizing my data or standardization of my data. And you can do all of that and commit them in different commits. So you can always come back to them at a later point in time. It's not That's great. And sometimes it is not even a best practice to run the whole experiment and then just make one commit at the end of it. It's not wrong, but then the way to achieve reproducibility is to have these checkpoints at different points in time. So by committing at different iterations, you will be able to go back to that specific iteration very easily by just check out that commit and there you are. That's great. And by the way, if anybody in the audience has questions, then please feel free to go in the Q&A. You can also ask those um, uh, with or without your name. So if you want to do the you, you do so, uh, please go ahead and do so and we'll answer the questions as they appear. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's give it some time for the audience to come up with any questions. Meanwhile, we just you know, saved our model. Let's load the model and then feed it some images and see how our model is predicting. What it what I'm saying is it's time for cute dog images at this point in the demo. And let's just and yeah. that's what we came here for. Cute dog, cute dog images. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah, so we have that loaded. So let's go ahead and plot the predictions. As you can see clearly, some our model has done a good job by predicting the same class and some of it not so good by predicting them in a different class. But it's understandable because the model accuracy was less and we ran very few iterations just for the sake of the demo. But then you are such a cute dog too. That's nice. So, so now I have uh, one result set. Maybe that's good, maybe not. And let's say I want to rerun this experiment with some other parameters. How will I do that? Yep, exactly. So as you can see, not our model does, did not do a great, great job. So let's go ahead and like tweak certain parameters and then, you know, let's not normalize, for example. And then you can, depending on what your requirements are, what you want to play around with, you can change your parameters. And once you have these parameters, we, you can go ahead and run the same set of steps or even choose to ignore or leave certain steps out. But here, as you can see, change a couple of parameters, and then it's going to have similar set of steps, like create an experiment to branch, again, train the data, load the training data, train the model, write the model metrics, configs, all of them back to our LakeFS repo, and then just 
at the end, see how our model has performed. So experiment two is similar to what we did with experiment one. So I'm just gonna quickly run through this and then we'll go to our LakeFS UI and see how things are. So we made some changes. Are we running this on a different branch? Are we running this on new branch? Okay. Yeah, so this is in a different branch. As you can see, we are under experiment two branch, which is which just got created. And once you go here, we can again see there was a raw file, which are just the images, and then configs were pushed, and then there was also model metrics. And then now we also have model artifacts. We can go to the commits of the experiment two to see all the steps that we just quickly ran. What were they? The repository was created. The training data was imported, the model was trained, so save the model metrics and the model artifacts as well. So both the experiments have been done now. I mean, you can have like hundreds of experiments because in real life, there is going to be at least a few tens and hundreds of experiments run before you come at a, you know, arrive at a correct model to deploy. But here we just, you know, stuck to two for the purpose of the demo. And we have it done. As you can see, Okay, so again, not so bad, not so good. So you may want to in real, continue the experimentation. But for now, what we are going to do is we're going to like compare these two branches with the experiment one and two. And we will read the model metrics file and, com and compare if the experiment one gave us better accuracy or experiment two. Whatever the winning model or the winning branch is, we're going to merge that branch into main. And here I have left main branch with we have not touched our main branch ever since we created it. It literally has nothing. I wanted to treat main branch like a production branch. So only in the end, we identify, you know, whichever is the winning branch, experiment one or two, and we'll merge that into the main, which is equivalent to deploying the best model in production. And all of this could be automated. And so it's very easy to maintain these as well. So you can run hundreds of experiments without having to even manually intervene at any point. So let's go ahead and compare who the winning branch is, which is experiment two for us. So what I'm gonna do is merge experiment two into our main, which is the merge API. You can go here and see now currently main would have all these you know, raw metrics, configs and artifacts from experiment two we will but, be able to in the comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My question is exactly that. Did I lose the, the lineage now or can I go back to see what was done in for main in a commit log, mm -hmm. which is I think what you're showing me right now. Yeah, so <laughs> when you go into the commit, you should be able to see so all the lineage of actions that happened in the experiment two branch because that is what we merged it into our main. So you still have the lineage all the way back to work raw data. And you can even go multi steps because sometimes it takes multiple steps to even arrive at the raw data. So you can go all the way back to the ETL job that created this raw data and so on. Yeah, and I think that in uh, in newer versions of LakeFS, you can also go, which are available in GA2, you can also go the opposite, right? You can go from a file and find the commit, like a blame, like a git blame, go find the commit that did mm -hmm. it. So for those of you who are interested, if you want to try this on your own, you'll actually have even a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's on the latest version. Now we also have a git blame like functionality. That's cool though. Yeah. It's like literally a blame who found like who actually created this data. That's one thing. To Very do. cool. So yeah, so this is our experimentation. So we just had two different experiments, but all of this was automated by LakeFS Python APIs by starting from creating a branch, doing different steps in our ML pipeline, and then merging the winning branch into production all the way. And now LakeFS has another interesting feature, which is like tagging, similar to you know branch tags that Git offers. So what it means is that suppose when you are running all these different experimentations and iterations, you want to tag a specific commit or a branch saying, oh, I think this might be the winning branch. I want to tag it, say, I don't know, like whatever timestamp or whoever the user was that created that experiment or iteration. You can always create a tag to any commit or branch that you want at the top of it. 
And here, what I'm doing is I'm going to show you how to use tags to reproduce a specific experiment, maybe. And let's just go ahead and create the tag. And I'm just using the timestamp to create our tags, the tag IDs. And let us go ahead and create this tag on this experiment one branch, which I'm going to do. And currently, as you can see here, when we see the repository, we have like four branches, but currently there are no tags because we didn't tag any commit. So let's go ahead and create that tag. So this specific commit ID is now tagged with this tag ID. So now I can reproduce my experiment by using the tag ID instead of my branch name. If you want to see the parameters before, it's going to have the data and everything under specific branches. But now we're going to use that specific tag, which is this commit ID, essentially. So we are checking out a specific commit and then running our reproducing our experiment from that commit. So let's run this. This is how it looks. And let's go to our UI and even see if our tags are being created. Yes. And then again, you can see from that tag, we have the raw data, metrics, configs, and artifacts, all of that from specific commit. So let's load the model from that specific tag. Before that, we need the data. We need to pre-process that data. And then let's model load the model. And once we have the model, let's use that data and the model that we loaded to just see how our model is predicting. Just a quick visual output before we did anything with this. Mm -hmm. And how is this model performing? I guess not bad, not good either. And so this is how by just checking out a specific commit ID, we are like in, I don't know, like a few seconds, we are able to reproduce that iteration of an experiment just by checking out that commit. And yeah, I guess that's all I had for today. Do we have any questions from the audience that, or anything that, I don't know, any feature that you want to highlight or if you have anything else that need to be discussed? Let's see. I have a few things that I just to sum this up that I can, if I can share my screen, I'll show this up. We have some questions. What happens if the experiments branches after the experiments are done? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, so, you know, what happens to the experiment branches after they're done? What can, what can happen to those? Yeah. So there are two things. One is if you want to leave them as is, you can, but then mostly what I see the ML engineers do is delete these uh, experiments because at the end of the day, if they were not the winning models, it's just like a temporary sandbox environment I spun up to run my experiment. It's not successful. Just destroy the sandbox or delete that branch and then move on to create more branches for other experiments. Right, and it's worth mentioning that uh, LakeFS has an ability to run garbage collection, right? So even though we didn't copy the, the, we didn't copy the files, some new files were created Right, and you have the ability to 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 configure garbage collection. This is uh, you can do it on the open source version. It's managed on the cloud as well, and basically you it can be branch specific garbage collection. So you can say for my production, I want to be able to keep everything and be able to go back a year. But for my experimentation branches, if you have a file that no experiment branch commit that's older than three days is pointing to it, delete that, and that will help you clean that up as well. So there is there are ways to manage this at scale as well for those branches. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope I answered the, we answered the question. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we come up with just a few things? Uh, when you create, oh, do you copy the, oh, great question. When you create multiple branches, do you copy the raw data every time? You know, that's a great question because I saw the raw data every time in every branch. Ah, okay. No, let me maybe quickly share my screen. It does not copy the raw data everywhere. I will show you the Minayo console, which will give us a better understanding of how LakeFS works underneath. First things first, when you create a new branch, it will not copy all of the data into the new branch. It will only copy pointers to the data, which is why, so the directory structure is essentially just 
being copied, not the actual images that are getting copied. And I wanted to show you here, as you can see, the Stanford Docs data is the actual bucket that have our images and annotations. And the LakeFS repository, we created it on top of ML experiment LakeFS repo. And the size of it is not even, you know, like few KBs. So it is not copying all these objects, but it's just copying different pointers to access those objects. As you can see, the repo is just 26 objects and the dog's data and the data set has a lot of them. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, like if it does copy and write, basically, since the data, since the objects and the data store are immutable, uh, we manage metadata. And then only when a new file is being created, we'll share it. But objects that are the same across multiple commits, you'll have the many commits pointing to the same physical objects. Um, and then there's a question. So we only merge to master main the branches with the best model. The answer is yes, if you want, right? Uh, like if is not uh, opinionated about this, but this will be in this specific use case, I think we know that's what you presented, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's also dependent on what you are optimizing for. Like in this experiment, I wanted to optimize for accuracy. You may be optimizing for F1 score or you want to deploy a cascade of models to production. So you can have whatever logic you want at the end of it, you will be able to implement it with LakeFS. I did a simple logic of just comparing the accuracy and then the winning one gets merged to prod. But if you have a very complex logic that says, oh, I want to check this, this and this, and only at the end of it, if all of the constraints are matched, then I want to deploy to prod, you will be able to implement that as well. So this is just one simple use case of what I wanted. Yes. Is it common practice to manage versions of the data itself used for training? Um, I think that's a great question. Yes, we see for a lot of, and you know, I'll let you give more details because you know better than me, but we see very commonly across multi of our users that they use the metadata for the commit the same way that, v that Vino did to reference um, the, the Git commit, for example, or some, a lot of times it's even like a step in a pipeline. Uh, if you, we, we have customers integrating with Airflow, Daxter, Kubeflow, Perfect, uh, others that, um, that uh, are God, there's a lot that, that we hear in the field. <laughs> and, uh, and it's very common to have also the commit reference that step in the execution of a pipeline as a part of this as well. Uh, have you know anything to add on, on, on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the common practice mostly is to only store versions of the features and not the raw training data. But then only if you only store these features, specifically with the experimentation side of things, right? Currently, we don't follow all of the best practices and only in some of the companies that I worked with, we did this best practice of versioning all of the training data as well, because you never know tomorrow you want to experiment with a new feature. And now suddenly you don't know what training data corresponds to this feature set. So only by you know versioning the training data, you will be able to create new features and you know associate all of them together as well. Wow, Vino, thanks. I read the questions wrong. Uh, <laughs> I answered the, the I answered the code. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and we also, Vino, you and I were in a discussion with uh, with the with 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 the user once that uh, shared also like the compute cost of reproducibility versus the 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 the, the versioning cost of reproducibility. So I think there's many moving parts, but it's very cool that we have the ability to do those here. Um, mm -hmm. Is LakeFS entering the MLOps platform space? I think, uh, so uh, I'll answer that if that's okay. Uh, LakeFS is a data versioning solution for all the data practitioners, MLOps including. We have multiple uh, users uh, use, using, um, when I say multiple dozens of users using uh, LakeFS for, for machine learning, we always have. Uh, we also have, uh, many, many, many users using it for generic data engineering uh, uh, resources. Um, MLOps specifically, um, uh, yeah, as a part of the data operations in general, uh, LakeFS also covers MLOps and, and has been for, for uh, as long as I can remember anyway. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, okay, let's see. Okay, so, so just to sum up, and what we spoke about, look, this raw data that appeared everywhere and was never copied saves a lot of storage. And specifically in the MLOps world, we have, we have users, I remember speaking with users, you know, uh, store, I remember once they have a line that I tell people, uh, uh, S3 is cheap, but it's not free. And then I had one person look at me and he said, well, not for me, right? Because when you do this for videos and images and so on, it adds up and it adds up quickly. And you have a tremendous amount of savings that you can achieve by creating multiple uh, isolated environments with and th testing ETLs, experimenting with, with, with machine learning operations without actually copying the data. So that's the first thing that you get. The second is just like the data engineering or the ML operation efficiency that, that you get after this is tremendous because things that can take days, weeks, now take second and seconds. And there's an, a third space, which honestly we didn't speak about today and that's okay, which is in case something happens to your production data and something will happen to your production data because you know, life, uh, then you never have to troubleshoot again under fire ever again. Uh, because you can always just revert back to the last commit and then you have your copy of the broken data that you can investigate and carry on doing that. All of this is available in open source. We also have uh, a paid offering, uh, a managed hosted offering like if it's cloud. Uh, if anybody's interested in that, please reach out and we can give you more details about the, the pricing of that as well, which is uh, relatively inexpensive in the world of data engineering. As next steps uh, for us, Today, there are two things that I wanted to kind of share with everyone. One, we have an incredibly useful Slack community. If you go to HTTPS, like FSIO forward slash Slack, that will redirect you to our Slack channel. Uh, you can join. There are a couple of uh, channels there getting started and help that are very useful if someone has questions. And uh, secondly, uh, again, the samples that we have before are available here uh, for you guys uh, to download. I think there was an question that jumped and went away. I don't know. No. So, you know, let's wait and see if there's any more questions. Yep. Going once, going twice, going twice, going twice and a half. Okay. Uh, Rina, this was so much fun. Thank you for sharing. And uh, thank you for sharing cute dog pictures as well. Made my day a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks everyone. Thanks for great questions as well. And yeah. See you in the Slack soon.